Dear God, school's different now. I don't understand the world, but I know that when hard things happen, I should pray, so that's what I do. I pray that we can keep learning, whatever that looks like, and that we'll be together, even if it's in a whole new way. God, I pray as we step into the unknown future that you continue to show me things about myself and life, things I can't learn in books, be with me, God, no matter how this year unfolds. Help us, God, to do our best every day. Even when every day isn't what we thought it would be. Keep us safe and keep us learning, one day at a time. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 Good morning. I invite you to stand as we join in reading scripture. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We did, we did not eat anyone's bread without paying. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not burden any of you. It was not because we have not that right, but to give you in our conduct an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone will not work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living. Brethren, Brethren do not be weary in well-doing. Good morning. Our children's devotion uh, comes from the book, How Great Is Our God, by Louis Giglio. I used it in my uh, video devotion last week. And the title of our devotion today is called Friends Forever, and it comes from John 15, 12, which says, Love each other as I have loved you. Elephants make fabulous friends. In an elephant herd, each seems to understand what the others are feeling. If one elephant is unhappy, the others will go to it and comfort it. Usually this means chirping softly and putting their trunks in his mouth. It's kind of a hug, elephant style. Aren't you glad we don't hug that way? If an elephant is hurt, the others will help it. And if one is threatened by a predator like a lion, the other elephants will form a circle around it and defend it. Elephants are such good friends that if they are separated, even for years, they remember each other and rush to hug when they see each other again comforting each other, helping each other, and protecting each other. That sounds like a pretty awesome definition of friendship, whether you're an elephant or not. Jesus said it this way, love each other as I have loved you. And that's the secret to getting and keeping good friends. When a friend is hurting, offer comfort and hugs. If a friend needs help, go and help too. And if a friend is being attacked by gossip, bullying, frenemies, or just a real bad day, stand up for your friends, stick together, that's what friends do. Pray for each other and share encouraging scriptures from God's word. By the way, that's what Jesus does for you. He's your friend forever, and what could be greater than that? I think that's super relevant to us today because as school is starting, um, it's hard to remain calm <laughs> when people make us upset. Isn't that right, kids? Isn't that right, adults? <laughs> 
okay? It's, it's hard sometimes to, to be the one who is comforting when, when all the time we want the comfort, but we have to put ourselves below others, just like Jesus put himself out there for us and did what was necessary in order to save us. He didn't have to do it, but he still did it because he loved us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for Jesus telling us that we need to love one another as he loved us. Lord, thank you for him first loving us through the cross. Lord, there's no way we can repay that. There's no way that we can ever, um, in any, really any way, to show you how much we love you, Lord. But I pray that through this time of worship, that we can just give back a little bit to you. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Before we begin our time of prayer today, I do want to thank all of you for your prayers, uh, for myself and for Case. I'm healing well. I can speak again, eat again. That's good. And, and Case uh, seems to be doing pretty good, <laughs> even without the cast, so that's good. But this morning, as we gather together in a time of worship and praise, and we do join in this time of prayer I want us to read from Colossians 4, starting in verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And I want to make sure that we, we are doing just that, that we aren't just always bringing our complaints and our troubles to God in our prayers. Let us make sure that we are recognizing every good thing that He is doing for us, understanding that even in the times of, of struggles, he's shaping us. And so today, among the other topics we're going to pray about, please, please in, in, incorporate those into your prayer. But I would ask that we do continually pray for our brother Joe and Janet, and our sister Janet. Joe is, is doing dialysis, he's doing chemo, he's doing radiation. He, he's really going through quite the trial, and I know... Janet is right there along with him. And I, I would ask that we all are praying for them today and every day throughout our week. So if we would begin just by dedicating some prayers to Joe and Janet this morning. Would you pray with me? pray with me also this morning for those that each of us have on our hearts that we know we are sharing the gospel with but father that, that we are doing what you're calling us to be would you all pray for those that aren't here or joining us online that we are reaching out to that we are being the the light of the world that God's called us to be
Would you also pray this morning something that we must continually be praying, and that is that all that we do, not just today, but every day, and all the decisions we make would be in alignment with the will of God our Father, that we would be seeking His guidance in every decision we make in our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you so very much for the many blessings you've given us. Father, I thank you for the healing that you have given me so quickly. I thank you for the healing for my son. Father, I thank you that we are all get, able to gather here today, something that we can very easily take for granted, that we have that freedom, and I thank you for that. And I ask that we would all continue to do as you have called us to do. Father, I, I do pray for my brother Joe. I know he is in a time of trial and struggle medically. And I ask that you would be with the doctors. Be with Joe. Be with Janet. I ask that you would also show myself as well as all of us what we can do to support Joe and Janet in this time. Help us to understand how to bear their burden through this time of struggle. Father, I ask that you would help each of us to be bold for you, to be the salt of the earth, to share your word with everyone we come in contact with and invite them into what we have in our hope of eternity in you. Father, I, I also pray that just so often we should not lose sight that everything we do is in alignment with you. I ask that we would continue to be guided by your Holy Spirit in the search for the lead path that you have been preparing for here at Minerva First Christian Church. That I would seek your guidance in how to lead my family that we would seek your guidance in how to make the decisions in our personal life. And Father, that we would give you thanks for that. Father, I thank you so very much for your son and what he means to us. And it's in his name that I pray these things. Amen. We the people believe these truths. God is the creator of everything. Yes, everything. Earth and sky. What is below and what is beyond. All that we see moving. And even those things we don't see. God created it all. And we believe that God created humans. All of us. And we are all created equal in the sight of God. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of a virgin. We believe that he suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, died, and was burned. But we believe that was not the end. We believe he rose again, and when he did, 
he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. We believe that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And we believe that there is forgiveness for our sins through Jesus. We believe that he has called each of us to live a life worthy of his name, a life of sacrifice. What is this life? It's a life of love and truth and grace. A life that speaks by actions as much as words. A life that is marked by his life. And we believe that God is here with us now. Because we are his church and this is our creed. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you this morning and to open God's Word together. And welcome to all of those who are joining us online. It is my understanding last week we had 250 views uh, of our service last week. That is incredible. Uh, and that tells me that uh, no matter... Yeah, you can go ahead and clap for that. Yeah, sure. No matter persecution, no matter prison... No matter hatred, no matter violence, no matter pandemics, the gospel always finds a way to reach the people who need to hear the message. And that's a testament to our great God who loves people. In Galatians 2, we're told that, I got, I got to turn this on first. It's on now. <laughs> there we go. In Galatians 2, we're told that Paul made a second trip to Jerusalem taking with him Barnabas and an often overlooked and very much underappreciated man named Titus. And being that the message of Titus and the ministry of Titus is so timely and so relevant to us today, I thought it'd be a good idea for us to take a quick detour from our time in the book of Galatians and learn about this man and learn about the ministry of Titus. And we're going to finish that up today. Remember from last week that Paul gave to Titus an incredibly difficult assignment, an incredibly challenging task, and that is to go to the island of Crete and there to set in order what remains and to appoint elders in every city as Paul had directed him. Just a quick review, Crete is this island right there, kind of right in the middle of the Mediterranean world, uh, which was the world where Paul lived and ministered um, throughout his life. Crete is uh, it's kind of a large island. It's about 160 miles wide. It's about 8 to 40 miles across, north to south. It's very rugged. It did not have the usual well-developed Roman road systems that we see in other places around the Mediterranean world. And therefore, Titus had his hands full. He had a difficult task in order to achieve one part of his mission, and that is to appoint elders in every city on the island. 3,200 square miles that were now under the care of Titus. What a logistical mess. But this was the man that Paul was confident in that he could do the job. And not only that, but we looked at a variety of statements last week made about the culture of Crete. And just for one reminder, we'll look again at the statement from Epimenides. And remember that Epimenides is just a Greek poet who lived during the time of Paul, actually before the time of Paul, but he was from the island of Crete, and he lived there, and this is what he says. Paul says, one of themselves, that's Epimenides, a prophet of their own, said, and listen to this statement, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and then Paul says, this is true, Titus, this is true, this is what you're going into, this is the type of culture that you're going to encounter when you go to that island for ministry. So we're looking at the instructions and we're looking at the counsel that Paul gives to Titus because the words given to Titus would be very applicable to our current circumstances in our nation today. 
And so quick review, we learned last week that the dominant attribute of God spoken in the epistle to Titus is that God is a God who saves men. He alone is Savior. Five times in the book of Titus, the Apostle Paul uses the term Savior in just those three short chapters, emphasizing that if Titus was to have success on Crete, and if we're going to have success in our nation today, we must proclaim and live out the truth that God saves men and women. Indeed, this is the message that defines everything we do. And I like how Paul instructs Timothy, his other son in the faith, here in 1 Timothy 4. Paul says, for it is for this. What is this? It's the sharing of the gospel of grace. It is for this that we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. In other words, the message of salvation is offered to all men. It is near us, it says in the book of Romans. The message is always being proclaimed somewhere and by some means but it is only a reality for those who believe, and you must. If you're with us this morning in this room, if you're joining us online, you've heard the message. Now you must believe. You must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. Salvation is found in no other name and by no other means. And if you want to make that decision today, you can and I pray that as the message is spoken throughout the rest of the sermon, the Father would draw you to himself and that the Holy Spirit would give you the desire to come forward and to be baptized today. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we are so thankful that you are a God who saves. You are our Savior. And Father, it's such a powerful expression of your amazing grace, your great grace that you entered this world through the person of your son and you made a way you made a way for salvation and father we are forever thankful for that and father i just pray as we finish up this morning this lesson about titus his ministry in the book of titus i pray father that your holy spirit fill this room i pray that it would be he who opens our eyes and opens our ears to hear the things that we need to hear I pray, Father God, that your spirit would open the hearts and the minds of those who have not yet made that great confession of faith, and that through the power of your spirit, those people would come today, and that they would receive salvation through your precious son, Jesus Christ. And Father, it's in his name that I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles open to Titus, and I hope that you do, you'll quickly see that it is a straightforward no nonsense, no compromise structure to it. It is a book that is precise. It is a book that is right to the point. It speaks what needs to be done in Crete, in truth, in love, and it has a grace-filled approach to the situation. It is the precise same approach that we need to take in our world today. So if we looked at the structure of the book of Titus, it looks like this. Very simple structure, three chapters, Chapter 1 is designated for elders, and there it lists the qualifications that Titus would need to expect to those elders that he was going to appoint in every city. Chapter 2 is very important for us because in chapter 2, it relates the necessities and the expectations that believers are to have with each other. Chapter 2 focuses on interactions inside the church. And then chapter 3 in Titus relates on how we, as believers, are to interact with everyone outside of the church. Okay? That was the message the Apostle Paul gave to Titus. And woven all throughout this structure is the concept of sound doctrine. In Paul's pastoral epistles, and I mean 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, those three pastoral epistles Paul uses the word sound nine times. However, five of those times are designated for the book of Titus. 
So for us, just like what was happening on Crete, as our nation and our culture continues on this downward spiral, it is not a time for wishy-washy doctrine. As we're going to see, as things become more and more challenging for the church, as a result of the cultural shifts taking place right now, it is those churches whose doctrines have been tightened up and made sound and then taught to the people that will stand when persecution and tumultuous times soon come, and they will. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this is where sound doctrine begins. It's hard to land on a precise number, but the number of churches that are dying or already dead in America is pretty significant. And while the reasonings for that can be very complex, one of the main reasons stems from the fact that they're not living on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. They're not living on sound doctrine. And so when trials come and when persecutions come, those churches built upon a personality, they won't stand. Those churches built on philosophy or ideas and inventions of men will not stand. There are some churches around the country already who are looking into the not-so-distant future, and they see the tsunami of persecution of Christians on its way. And they've already presented statements to Caesar that they will gladly render to Caesar that which is his, but by no means will they render to Caesar that which belongs to the Lord, namely his church. It does not belong to the state. And it is the right and the responsibility of believers to gather to worship our Savior for edification, for learning, for communion, for baptizing others. We will certainly abide by social distancing practices, And we will certainly gladly and joyfully share our service online. But when we're told we cannot meet with the Lord and with other believers, we have a problem. Because we're commanded to do so. And those churches who have already made their intentions known are churches that are sound in doctrine. They are resolute in faith and they are obedient to the master. And they will stand. The church in Crete was about to die. Therefore, Paul makes known to Titus that he must be resolute in sound doctrine on the island. He could not waver. Let me show you those five times that sound is used in Titus. The first time is in Titus 1.9. And this is one of the elder qualifications. Interestingly enough, it's the last one given to Titus for his elders. And they are to be men who hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort, that's positive, exhort means to come alongside, to teach, to lead, to help understand, exhort in sound doctrine, and to refute, that's the negative, those who contradict. Refute just means to point out that which is incorrect, that which is wrong. That's the first time we see sound doctrine. Here's number two. This is in Titus 1, 12 through 13. We've already read part of this. Here the Apostle Paul tells Titus, one of themselves, Epimenides, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. And so one of Titus's main objectives is leading people to be sound in the faith at all costs, even if he has to reprove them severely. Number three is found in chapter two, first verse. And here Paul commands Titus, but as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Notice he does not say preach the things. He says, speak the things. In other words, Titus, whenever you're talking in any conversation, whether you're talking about the weather or the upcoming game, you must be speaking those things fitting for sound doctrine. And then right after that is number four. And this is a command for older men. 
in the churches on the island of Crete. And he says, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, here it is, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. And then number five, the fifth time we see that phrase sound, sound in speech in this case is in Titus 2, 6 through 8. And this is a command given to younger men. And just to be clear, I still consider myself a part of that list of younger men. Here Paul says, Likewise, Titus, urge the young men to be sensible in all things, to show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine. Very similar word there, purity and sound. Dignified, here it is, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponents will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. If Titus was going to have success on Crete, and if we're going to have success in our nation, if we're going to display to the world that we are people saved, kept, and transformed by the grace of God, we must be proponents of sound doctrine. And let's quickly define what that means. The Greek word for sound, hugiaino. The definition is to be sound, healthy, pure, uncorrupted. And that word was used in the Greek culture when someone was telling another person, I am well. I am in good health. Hugiaino. In the horse world, we desire a sound horse to ride. And what is a sound horse? It is a horse that is in its prime. It is a horse that is conditioned. It's strong. It's responsive. Listen, a sound horse is achieving fully that which it was created for. On the other hand, a horse that is not sound is a horse that is hurting. It's limping. It's weak. It's unable to move freely. It is unable to perform that which it was created for. I've worked with horses that weren't sound. It's resulted in concussions, broken bones, specifically a broken back. I once fractured three vertebrae in my lower back from a, a horse that was not sound. And it's by God's grace alone that I'm able to stand here with you and to preach. Doctrine that is not sound hurts people. Doctrine that is not sound is dangerous. Yes, it can even be deadly. Well, that's what the definition of sound means. Now, let's apply that to doctrine. Here's the definition of doctrine. Teaching, that is, from God, about God, and directs people to the glory of God. In other words, doctrine is simply that which is stated in the Bible, free of contamination from philosophies, from ideas, and from inventions of men. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's what's become a passion in my life. It's what I've decided to give my life over to as far as study and further education. It's why I was led to the school I'm currently attending. And I've had the incredible privilege and honor and blessing to be taught by some of the most precise Bible scholars in the country. Men who love the Lord, love the word, love people, and they love teaching it to people. And after 20 years of wrestling and struggling in education, I finally found the topic that I would love to teach on. And it's the topic that's been taken out of the schools, unfortunately. I've acquired the same desire as Paul, and I pray that you have the same desire also. For I determined to know nothing else, nothing else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I will tell you that Jesus Christ can be discovered in his word with the leading of the Holy Spirit and combined with times of prayer. The life and the words and the ministry of Jesus Christ is the manifestation of sound doctrine. Scott Swain says this. Great statement. Doctrine is the teaching of our heavenly father revealed in Jesus Christ and transmitted to us by the Holy Spirit in Holy Scripture. Listen, and it is to be received, it is to be confessed, and it is to be followed in the church. And that's what we're going to get to next, to the glory of God's name. It's a great statement. 
Well, we know that unsound doctrine was being taught on Crete because Paul tells Titus about some of the false teaching and teachers taking place on the island. And this is in Titus 1, 10 through 11. Paul says, okay, Titus, listen up. There are many rebellious men on the island, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So, specifically, why is sound doctrine so important? Well, listen, our faith is derived and built upon a specific message. The message has many parts to it. It's multi-layered, it's multi-dimensional. And there's no way that I have time to fully dive into every aspect of sound doctrine. To do that, we would have to order pizza and stay here all day. But I do want to reveal to you that which is of first importance, and it is the foundation to all the rest of doctrine. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, we have a very important paragraph for us, especially when it comes to sound doctrine. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, and he said these, these words, For I delivered to you, listen to this phrase, as of first importance. Right here it is. Very important paragraph. As of first importance, what I also received, not learned, received. Okay, this goes back to his conversion on the Damascus Road. I received it from Jesus Christ, straight from him. Here is the list of that which is of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then in verse 5, he goes through a list of people who Christ appeared to. 500 brethren, the 12. And then he specifically names Cephas, that's Peter, James, and himself, those three. Why does he mention those three? Because the church was founded and built on those men and their ministry. In other words, one thing that is of first importance is the historic fact that Jesus did arise from the grave. That is indisputable. It is a historic fact. He appeared to many men. And then he goes on in his list of those things that are of first importance. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me did not prove in vain. God's grace is of first importance. And if you're a believer, you are what you are by his grace alone. And then the last item on this list, verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Speaking this message is of first importance. Believing this message is of first importance. This is the message that must be spoken. And this is the message that must be heard. That God's saving grace to mankind is fully displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. And manifested in full glory by his death and resurrection. This is what you need to believe should you be saved. This is what you need to tell those whom you want to see saved. And this is what Titus would have to proclaim on the island of Crete. This is sound doctrine. The true gospel of grace that the Father uses to call people to himself. And why is it so important that we speak this message? Well, let's look at a couple of examples why. Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul says, In him you also, listening, listen, here it is, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. And that phrase, given as a pledge, literally means an engagement ring with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Very important part of that passage. At the beginning, after listening to the message of truth, 
Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, which means someone needs to speak and others need to hear. And then in 2 Thessalonians, one more example. Here the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Thessalonica, and he begins with these wonderful words, but we should always give thanks to God for you. He's speaking to the church. What a wonderful thing to say. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And then this is so important right here. Verse 14, it was for this he called you through our gospel, through the message. The Father calls people to himself that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, brothers and sisters, is the power of the gospel. And this would be the essential message Titus would take to Crete. And it must be the message we proclaim to the world around us. Perhaps you've heard the message before. But this morning you're hearing it anew with a receptive heart. And the Father is calling your name this morning. If that's you, you need to respond by confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believing in your heart that the Father raised him from the dead. Be baptized and begin a new life as a son or daughter of God. I go back to the quote that I left you with last week from Heinrich Heine. Show me your redeemed life, and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. And this is really the thoughts of all people around the world who watch us, who take note of the way that we live our lives, and we place much emphasis on living as Christians should, and rightly so. This was the reason that Titus was sent to Crete, to set in order what remains, to get the people on the island living as they should, this can only take place with the foundation of sound doctrine. Indeed, listen, sound doctrine is the motivation. Sound doctrine is the initiation for sound living. Looking at the structure of Paul's epistles, it is clear that he sees a definite relationship between sound doctrine and sound living. But sound doctrine always comes first. For example, when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, I always like to use the book of Ephesians. And I like to use it for a lot of reasons. But one of the primary reasons is because it has a very simple structure to it. It's made up of six total chapters. And we like to go right away to Ephesians 4. And that is a great chapter. Because it tells us what to do and what not to do. But it's Ephesians 4 for a reason. Because there's three chapters that come first, emphasizing sound doctrine that must first be taught to people. Before, because that's the motivation. That's the initiation for sound living. In other words, Ephesians 4 must be backed by, motivated by, preceded by, and initiated by sound doctrine. Or else, it leads to legalism. When we preach and teach sound doctrine. God is taken out of the box, and he's made big, he's made glorious, he's made mysterious, he's made incomprehensible, so that when we consider his great grace, and his great mercy, and his great love, we cannot help but desire to please our Father and our Master, who graciously and lovingly saved us, and wants us to display his saving nature to the world by living as people through sound living. Furthermore, without sound doctrine coming first, the only way to emphasize the call to sound living in chapters 4 through 6 is through legalism. And suddenly we have to contend with Pharisaic legalists. And people don't respond very well to this. But they will respond to sound doctrine taught in truth and love as Paul instructed Titus to do on Crete. He would not succeed any other way. And listen, you will not succeed any other way with your family, with your children, with your friends, with your co-workers, than by plunging them deep into God's word and with love and grace, helping them to know Christ and the Father, then teach them how to live accordingly. And so the first three chapters of Ephesians 
emphasizes sound doctrine as expressed through Paul's teaching in chapters 1 through 3 that salvation belongs to the Lord, as it says in the book of Psalms. And as Jonah said in the belly of the great fish, by the way, if you read his prayer, he ends with that phrase, salvation belongs to the Lord. When you read those three chapters, and I hope you do this afternoon, I hope you read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. When you read those three chapters, you will read over and over and over again that salvation belongs to the Lord. He chose us. He loved us. He made us alive. He raised us up with him. He seated us with him in the heavenly places. And on and on and on. Our job is to believe. To believe God is a God who saves. And then, when we get to chapter 4 and 6 in Ephesians, Paul implores us to live in response to the Father's grace and love by living in unity, 4, 1 through 16. Living differently than the world, chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Walking in love and light and wisdom, chapter 5, verse 1 through chapter 6, verse 9. And then engaging in spiritual warfare, chapter 6, verse 10 to 20. So remember this, as you're teaching and as you're ministering to your family, to your children, to your friends, to your coworkers, as you're ministering and teaching to the people around you, this is the pattern Paul follows. It is the pattern he gave to Titus for Crete, and it is the pattern we need to follow today. It looks like this. Sound doctrine initiates motivates and leads to sound living that displays a gracious God who loves and saves those who believe in his message. And Titus probably played this over and over and over again in his mind as he ministered to the people on Crete. Let me show you this pattern in the book of Titus. We're going to look at just one section here. The underlined sections that you see is doctrine, sound doctrine. The sections that are not underlined, it's the application to that doctrine. Okay, it's the sound living application. So, for example, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's the doctrine of the incarnation. Sound living application. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. To live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, before you get to those things in verses 12 through 13, you need to start with the incarnation. And then verse 14, Paul shifts back into sound doctrine. Who gave himself for us. That's the doctrine of atonement. To redeem us from every lawless deed. That's the doctrine of imputation. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession. That's the doctrine of sanctification. And what should those people who have been blessed in this way, what should they do as far as application for sound living? They should be zealous, passionate for good deeds. So for the island of Crete, the Apostle Paul gets very straight to the point and very practical in regards to sound living for the people on the island. And this takes us to chapter 2. Here Paul gets very practical. Great section of scripture. He tells Titus, But as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine, because that's where it all begins. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance, there's the application, the sound living application. Verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that, this is profound, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. It is very telling that Paul begins with older men and older women when listing the duties of sound living. Why does Paul begin with older men and older women? 
Well, Titus had a very difficult task on Crete. And there's a certain level of discernment and a certain level of wisdom that can only come with age. And very often we're quick to seek out the counsel of the new and the sophisticated and the academic young minds or those who have a Ph.D. after their name or those who have a website. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But Job reminds us in Job 12, 12, wisdom is with aged men. With long life is understanding. And then in Proverbs, the glory of young men is their strength and the honor of old men is their gray hair. And then in Proverbs again, a gray head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. And then in the Psalms, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. And then this, listen, they will still yield fruits in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. So you need to know this morning, if you are of age, you are full of sap and you're very green. There's a certain level of wisdom and discernment about life, about God, about grace, about the faith that can only be achieved when you've had to have a funeral for your spouse, when you've had to have a funeral for a child or a grandchild. There's a certain level of wisdom and discernment that comes when you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death that those of us who haven't been there yet don't understand. There's a certain level of wisdom and discernment that comes when your strength is gone and you leave each day in pain and in perpetual exhaustion that us young people just don't understand yet. It is a level of wisdom and discernment that cannot be learned, it cannot be bought, but it comes only with a long life. And from those who have been there and done that, and they've lived through and they've persevered through the many trials of life, With this wisdom comes like what Paul said to Timothy near the end of his life when he was of age. He told Timothy, for this reason, what reason? Preaching the gospel of grace, my life. For this reason, I also suffer these things. But listen, here's wisdom that comes with age. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And what did the Apostle Paul entrust to him? His very life, his salvation, he entrusted to him until that very day because he is able to guard. With old age and experience comes the assurance and the security of salvation. There's a certain level of understanding concerning the Father's grace when you've walked through the valley and you realize the good shepherd was with you all the way. And there are many of you out there today who have walked through that valley. And I know some of you have had those funerals for spouses, for children, for grandchildren, for siblings. And may God bless you for persevering and being such an inspiration and a role model for us who haven't been there yet but we will. You are often overlooked, and I apologize for that. You possess a level of wisdom and discernment that when encapsulated with sound doctrine and displayed in sound living is powerful. Powerful enough to alter the course of a nation. We need you. As Titus needed that level of wisdom and discernment on Crete, so we desperately need it today. And I know some of you are traveling through that valley right now. I know there are some of you who are taking on the the blessed and the honorable responsibility of caring for an aged parent at the moment. And it must be difficult watching time take away their strength and their energy. There are some among us who are literally fighting right now for their lives because of sickness and cancer, like our brother Joe. 
Just this week, a dear family of ours had their lives invaded by the news of pancreatic cancer that has infected a family member of theirs. You are in the valley. You need to hear the assuring words of Jesus from John 10. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And you need to know that the Good Shepherd is with you, and he's with your loved ones. He is walking right alongside you in the valley. And you need to know that he alone can lead you beside the still waters. He alone can make you lie down in the green pastures. And out of grace and love, he restores souls. With him you are secure. He will not lose you. He will not forsake you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. Would he allow something so precious to him be lost? I don't think so. The instructions from Paul to Titus to lean on the wisdom and discernment of the old men and the old women in Crete is expressed even in the Psalms, a great psalm, Psalm 71. Here the psalmist cries out, O God, you have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me. Listen, this is the best way to spend retirement. Until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you. And then this, this can only come with age. You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. So how do the age declare his strength and his power to the world around us? Well, let's go back. But as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Here it is. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Older women, listen. After the unborn, no other portion of our society has been more forgotten, abandoned, abused, and politicized like younger women. Because of our indecent and selfish culture, many have been left alone with children with incredible responsibilities, and they don't know what to do. They need your wisdom, and they need your discernment. And brothers and sisters, here's the power of a church that abides in sound doctrine and that encourages the older men and women to display the word of God in sound living. Look at the end of verse 5. Titus, make sure the older men and women are engaged in sound living on Crete. Why? So that the word of God will not be dishonored. Do you see how important it is that we cling to sound doctrine? And that we display the gospel in sound living by obeying these words from Paul. And without question, the word of God is dishonored in our culture today. And yet it is our sword. And by its words, men can receive salvation. By its words, islands and nations can be changed. But it must first be honored. And if it's not honored, it can mean only one thing. Sound doctrine leads to sound living which leads to the word of God being honored. Therefore, if we work backwards, we as a nation must begin riding the ship by digging deep into God's word, clearly defining what the Father desires to teach us, and then living it out boldly in truth and in love through sound living. All of us. 
So as we conclude this morning, let's end with some sound doctrine from the Apostle Paul spoken to his true child in common faith, Titus. For we also were foolish ourselves once, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Listen, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly. What a phrase. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, Titus. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. If you've not experienced the kindness of God our Savior and his love for you, you can this morning by coming forward and publicly confessing that Jesus is Lord, by believing in your heart that the Father raised him from the dead, by being baptized. And then it would be our honor to help you begin a new life of freedom that can only be found in God's amazing grace. Come this morning. And if you're joining us online, please go to our website for contact information, and we would be glad to tell you about Jesus, the Savior. If you need prayer this morning, I know there's many going through difficult things today. Please grab a hold of one of us. We would be honored to pray with you. Father God, we thank you so much for this straightforward, very practical, rooted in sound doctrine book of Titus. And Father, as we look at the world around us and are just so confused and perplexed about what to do, may we heed the instructions that you gave to Titus. And may we take those words, and may we take those teachings, Father, through the power of your Spirit, and apply them to our lives. And may we go to those around us, and may we teach them, and exhort them in love and in truth, leading them, coming alongside them, and helping them to understand a sound doctrine, so that they can then live lives that are also sound. Father God, I just pray this morning that if anyone has been impacted by your words, Father, that you would, through the power of your Spirit, open their hearts and open their minds, give them a craving for holiness, give them a desire to be baptized. Father, call them, call them to your side. And Father, it's in the precious name of your Son that I pray these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. You know, we never know how God will pull things together as he does for us, but, uh, you know, it's just so interesting that uh, the message I'm going to give is on grace. But I also didn't know when I was going to be switching with Nate to try to come up this weekend that I would fit the old man (laughs) analogy. (laughs) But uh, God uses us in mighty ways. Every religion has one basic characteristic. If followers are trying to reach God, find God, or please God through their own efforts. But there is a big difference between religion and Christianity. The difference of religion is man reaching up to God, but Christianity is God reaching down to man. 
Paul talks about a distinction between the two systems and relating to, to God, relating to God is real. But he preferred different terms for it. Law and grace. In Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. These are the only two choices. As Christians, we are relating to God in terms of grace, while everyone else is still under the law, and the difference is summed up in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the three free gift from God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the, this verse, there are two key words, wages and gifts. Those relating to God in terms of wages will eventually get what they deserve by their works here on earth. And as it says in Romans, that is death. This is a law system, and it operates according to the strict uh, di dictates of the holiness of God. But those who choose the alternative way of relating to God will receive their eternal reward as a free gift. In fact, their free gift will actually be contrary to what they deserve. This is the grace system, and it operates according to the impulse of God's love for each of us. When Paul wrote in 327, he calls them two competing systems, the law of works and the law of faith. Romans 3.27 says, Then what becomes of our boasting, it, ex excludes, it is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works. No, but by the law of faith. In these verses, the word law, nomos, is used in an unusual and very general sense. The NIV translates it, it as principle. Other possibilities are methods, arrangements, order, system, or set of rules. Also, in this sense, the term works. Ton Ergon observes the law thus, sums up the essence of the law system, which operates on the principles of our works. Also, in the same verse, the term faith sums up the essence of the grace system. It operates on the principle of having faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see the parallels here? In Romans 3.27, works and faith. In Romans 6.23, wages and gifts. And in Romans 6.14, law and and grace. In reference to salvation, those who are confronted with the gospel must make a choice. As a sinner, they may choose to continue in to relate to God as a holy and just lawgiver and accept the wages of their, what they deserve on Judgment Day, which Paul wrote is death. Or they may accept the gospel offer and begin to relate to God on the good and loving gift giver and expect to receive eternal life as a free gift on that day. Those are the choices that everyone has to make. Work or faith, wages or gifts, law and grace. And for us as Christians, we are here now because we have chose grace. Let's go to the word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that you sent your son. And it is through your grace and the love that you have for us that we can live eternally with you. Father, we are challenged by the word today to go out and share your doctrine with truth. And by doing that, we hope that others will come to know you and have the faith in you 
and seek that free gift of grace for their lives. But Father, for us today, we just thank you that you've offered it to us. We have accepted it. And this time we are reminded that each and every day we are living under that grace. We thank you that you sent your son. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand as we praise God this morning.
coming out, and I want to thank all those who are joining us online. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come in and worship you, to give our lives over to you, Father, to do your will, Father, in our lives. Father, I pray for those here, for their families, to keep them healthy and safe, and uh, Father, to go out and show Jesus to the world. And also, those who are joining us at home, I pray that you'll watch over them, guide them, take care of them, and Father, may they be a witness as they can through uh, this uh, time in our world that uh, we seem to be confined slightly. Father, we just ask that uh, your mercies and grace will go with us as we leave this place. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Hey.